We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Gareth Soloway, President and Chief Market Strategist at VerifiedInvesting.com. Gareth, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be back here in the new year. It's always great to speak with you. We always kind of end up kind of unearthing some interesting gems here. And, you know, in that vein, I'd like to start talking about China and how bad the economy is really doing there. So why do you think there is such a disparity between the Chinese stock market and what the Chinese government is really doing about it at this point? Yeah, so so you're right. I mean, here's a chart of of the S and P 500 and the Chinese, the Hang Seng stock market. And what we can see is that historically they've generally traded in line, right? I mean, one may be above the other, but when they go up, they both usually go up, except for certain periods. And what we've seen recently is look at this divergence in the two stock markets: the S and P 500 hitting new all time highs. The Hang Seng market is basically at multi year lows. And what's fascinating about this? So number one, we we know that. China's struggling, right? So, so part of that is the communism, communism, and the crackdown on their own companies. It's been the trade tariffs, the and the kind of the, the the tit for tat that they've gotten into with the U.S. And ultimately, there's just a different kind of. Um, mindset there where the government is so much more in control that it's honestly chased a lot of money away. Global money has run from China. Good example of that is, you know, the U.S. used to be its biggest trading partner, and now it's actually Mexico. Mexico and the U.S. are the biggest trading partners. And so that rotation where companies are moving a lot of their plants, where they're building things to Vietnam and to other areas of the world away from China is really taking its toll there. And also you have to look at, you know, the Chinese stimulated their economy economy for decades by building these massive cities that no one lives in and and it's finally coming home to roost. So so it's a tricky scenario but the one thing I do want to draw kind of a comparison to is that historically the Chinese economy has been a leading indicator for the US economy and the stock market. And what I want to show you about that is if you look here and we go back, we can see that in general the Chinese stock market has started to fall months before the US and then the US follows suit. And a great example of that would be kind of right over here, right? In April of 2015, the US stock market continued grinding along neutral to upside, the China market came down and then you could see the US stock market started to have some trouble. Over here, another good example example, the China market popped up. The U.S. market was also at a high. We then saw the China market come down and not make new highs. The U.S. market made new highs until this big rollover in 2018 kind of caught it up to this dip in China. And then even if you look at COVID, right? COVID, we had the Chinese stock market topping out. The U.S. market went higher for another month or two and then had the big collapse. And what we're seeing here is you can look right here is that the China market topped out basically in February of 2021. And we had more upside. We then had the 2022 collapse in the U.S. markets. The China market just kept going down. Mm -hmm. In the October lows where the U.S. stock market started its tra transition to new all-time highs, what we're seeing now, the China market did go up, but now it's curled over. And what I'm expecting at some point here in the next few months is that eventually the U.S. stock market will start to turn down and play catch up. And again, you can just look at the history of these two charts. Eventually, they come back in tune with each other uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the, let's say, the disparity between the ways that the two countries stimulated both of their economies. Um mm -hmm. You know, obviously, China built a lot of ghost cities and tangible things, but I think you could argue that a lot of the stimulus from in the U.S. went into these financial assets, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. And and interestingly enough, and I talked about this a little bit this morning, is the the Federal Reserve. You know, we've we've supposedly been in this big tightening environment, right, where interest rates have gone from essentially zero up to five and a half percent. But if you look at the reduction in the Fed balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet is only down one point five trillion dollars from its all time highs. And if you look at how much U.S. debt has increased, it's been three four trillion in that same period of time. And so you could argue that really has there been a tightening in the markets of, of monetary policy? And you could argue that it hasn't. And that, again, leads us to why the markets are at all-time highs. There's so much liquidity still in the system. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a great point is that disparity between the balance sheet of the Fed and then actually seeing what the government has done in that same time um, yep. to the actual debt. It's a real, you know, interesting case of, as you put, are we actually tightening at that point? Yeah, yeah. And what's scary about it is that we're now talking about the Federal Reserve starting to cut rates and loosen monetary policy, and they only reduced the balance sheet by $1.5 trillion down to $7.5 trillion versus the high where it was at $9 trillion, right? So so you look at pre-2008, where we were, you know, really that wasn't that long ago. We're talking, you know, 16 years ago at this point, the Federal Reserve balance sheet was below $2 trillion. So in that time, we went from $2 trillion all the way up to $9 9 trillion and they've only backed it off 1.5 trillion and here we are going into this period where they're expected to cut rates and you know we see any sort of you know stumbling in the economy and you're probably talking about a fed balance sheet that's going to go north of 10 trillion now is it stimulative in the short term yes but it's also inflationary and it's also unsustainable right i mean at some point things cannot just continue to expand at this rate mm -hmm. i'd like to take a step back about you know, talking about China here, Gareth, you know, how does the Chinese government, how is it reacting to their stock market acting like this? And is it a real concern for them the way it is in the U.S.? Yeah, so so generally it hasn't been as much, but what we're seeing, and this is very recent now, is that the government's starting to come out with some major initiatives because, again, you're looking at a stock market that's essentially at multi-year lows. In fact, I want to actually flip over to this chart here, and let's let's take a look at the, the Hang Seng uh, market itself, just by itself, because I want to show you how long we've been at these levels. So if we go to our monthly chart, the last time we basically were up at this at these ranges where again we're way below this but you had a all-time high in 2007 we then had a double top of that same all-time high in 2018 and we're now back to levels we have not seen since 2008 2009 and so again you compare that to the stock market the US stock market which i mean think about where we were in 07 and then and then afterwards getting in that breakout we are hundreds of percentage points on the S&P above those levels. So so the, the Chinese stock market has underperformed and the government finally starting to take notice. And they announced, I believe it was just, you know, whether it was last night or the day before, they basically cut the reserve requirements for banks. And what that means is essentially the banks can lend more money, essentially pushing money into the system. Now, again, the question is, the more stimulus China does, does it cause commodity prices to go up? Is it inflationary? And then does that inflation then get exported to the rest of the world, which then keeps inflation higher across the globe? I mean, there's so many moving parts here that it's really incredible, but it's also scary. It absolutely is. And I think that that's, you know, we've talked about, I think you and I have even talked about before, this cyclical trend in the 70s of inflation in the 70s into the early 80s, this kind of triple higher highs. Um, yes. So it, it's and, going and, to be, as you say, interesting yet scary at the same yeah. time of seeing how that, how this inflationary impulse ends up materializing over the next, let's say, decade, right? And and you could see how this all could play out because it, you almost have the blueprint from the 70s and 80s, which is we had this same sort of pop in inflation. Then inflation came dropping dramatically back down. Everyone claimed victory just like we're doing now. And then what ended up happening is the economy slipped and they, they started to lower rates too quickly and inflation roared back and actually made a higher high. And you could almost see the writing on the wall of the Fed talking already about, I mean, here we have a, an unemployment rate of, you know, some of the lowest in history. And they're already talking about cutting interest rates later this year, which again is inflationary. It will cause more money in the system. You look at what China is doing in some of these other countries, and it's very, very possible that we'll see a reemergence of inflation. And the question is, does it go as hopefully not as high as it did back then? Because that was really crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how many rate cuts is the market expecting this year? Yeah. So the, the rate cuts, in fact, we can look at the Fed watch tool real quick here. Let's take a look. And just jumping to it real quick, but last I checked, the, the markets are looking at um, six rate cuts. In fact, let's just do a latest update. Yep, there we go. So here we can see right here that, again, initially we were looking for a cut, our first cut in, in March at the March 20th meeting. That now has been um, essentially 
pushed off. So you can see that we're expected through March to keep rates between uh, 525 and 550. Uh, Then we're looking for a 25 basis point cut in May uh, at the May 1st meeting there. And then every meeting after that into the end of the year is expected to be a rate uh, cut. So the market is pricing in six still. Um, The Fed continues to say three or less. And, And it's interesting that the markets are slightly moving in the direction of the Fed, meaning that we did see the expectation from a March cut go to the first cut in May, but they still are pricing in six, which which is going to be interesting to see. Is the market right or is the Federal Reserve going to be right? And I guarantee it, a lot of it's going to have to do with inflation. Whereas inflation later this year, does it get into the twos? Does it does do commodities continue to go lower like oil? Or do we see the economy still stay strong, which can also be inflationary? Mm-hmm. And I think an important piece to note there is each of those rate cuts that the market is expecting are quarter point rate cuts, right? Or 25. That's right. Points. That's right. And there's always a chance that we could get, you know, something else besides that in terms of, um, you know, did they do 50 basis points at one meeting or something else like that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, Gareth, one metric that the Fed is very data dependent on is job numbers, as you mentioned. So what is your outlook for jobs this year? Are you keeping an eye on any developing trends? Yeah, so so a couple things that have really popped into my my view here just in the last week or so is we've started to see earnings being announced, right? We started with the bank stocks and we heard Citigroup laying off 10% of their workforce, 20,000 people, BlackRock laying off people. Just today, we heard about eBay laying off 9% of their workforce. Um, SAP is laying off 8,000 people. And so it seems like, and interestingly enough, so this is very, very intriguing to me, uh, also sad, but, but it's that SAP said they're la- going to be laying off 8,000 because of AI coming into play. And so one of my biggest fears for the economy is that you're you're not only going to have a period where demand starts to slump from the consumer, which means layoffs and a recession, but it's also going to be accelerated or even be greater because of AI's um, ability to take over jobs. And so, you know, my worry, and and this is kind of a worst case scenario, but, you know, could we be in a period where we go multiple years with people losing jobs versus gaining um, because of AI extending that out. Now, AI will bring positives as well. It could bring costs down as well. Um, there's obviously that that positive. But if AI takes enough jobs away and those people don't have the skills to get new jobs, then you're talking about the consumer really starting to suffer, which would economically be very negative for consumer spending. Mm-hmm. And that's obviously a a trend that would probably develop over a number of years rather than just that's, acutely right and that's and that's my worry is that the recession will probably be in the next year or two you know give or take i would think by some point this year we're in the recession how long does it last depending on how the economy does but then does ai then you know the ai effects probably aren't even really starting i mean this is really preliminary as ai advances in its abilities to do tasks that's where that job loss can can literally last for five, the next 5 to 10 10 years potentially. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, there's companies starting to come out right now and, you know, explaining their earnings or, or posting their earnings. How does this affect companies that are exposed to China through their business? Yeah, so so that's really an interesting thing, and, and this is something that that flashed across my radar today. Uh, there's multiple companies coming out and saying, "Hey, guys, we're missing earnings in a major way because of China." Um, I forget the company that it was today, but there was one that just reported earnings. It was getting slammed. I think it was um, DD Dupont. In yeah, fact, DuPont. let's take a look at Dupont right now. Yeah, Dupont down a thirteen percent. By the way, it doesn't happen very often. You see Dupont down thirteen percent in one day, and so basically they said China's a mess. China, we're we're getting crushed in China. Because the economy is so bad. And what that means to me is be very aware of other companies that have massive exposures. For instance, we know Apple and their iPhone, huge market in China. Do we see Apple miss earnings in a couple of weeks or next week when they report? Um, do we see Tesla? Tesla reports today after the bell, and probably by the time this is up, potentially already out. What does Tesla say about uh, China and, and the sales that they're seeing? there? Are they seeing a slowdown? And so there's really very few companies that don't have some exposure to China, but the ones with the biggest exposure, those are the ones you have to be a little bit concerned about going into earnings here for the next couple quarters. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd like to continue that kind of conversation about earnings in a little bit here, talking a little bit about psychology. But before we get to that, another market that obviously you pay quite a bit of attention to, but I'd like to talk to you about it is the Bitcoin market. Mm -hmm. 
with this ETF approval. So what does that mean for that market? And is it a sign that that market is maturing? Yeah, it absolutely is a sign it's maturing and because the spot ETF is one more step towards normalization for crypto, right? There's still many, many people out there that are very skeptical of cryptocurrency and rightly show so considering the fraud that we've seen rampantly running and, and obviously the, you know, so many politicians are anti, there's a lot of politicians that are positive on it too, but, but the spot ETF is a very good positive step. It doesn't necessarily move the needle like day one though, and I think that's what people expected. The price of Bitcoin was running up into this news and everyone expected it to be this aha moment. It doesn't work like that. I mean, yes, there's a spot ETF, but grandma sitting in her her house isn't all of a sudden going to be like, oh, a spot ETF? Well, I'll put half my savings in it. You know, it doesn't really work like that. So it's a longer term positive that I think over time will be really beneficial, getting more and more people, even pension funds to invest in Bitcoin. Um, but certainly in the short term, it doesn't move the needle. One thing I want to show on my charts here, and I always like to remind people about avoiding the hype. You know, it's been something that I've done for a long, long time. But if we look at the 2017 bull market high before the big collapse, that was that when the futures debuted, it ran up and that was your top. When we look at the first top in 2021 here, that was the that was Coinbase IPO, the IPO of Coinbase debuted. There was so much hype going into it, and literally Bitcoin went from 65,000 down to 30,000. Mm -hmm. Then it recovered, went to 69, just as this, the ETF on the futures debuted. And then it went from 69 off of that news down here. So, so when you're looking at this, and if you're an investor, always remember that in general, hype drives prices to tops, not the beginnings of runs. Mm -hmm. And so here we have that top when the spot ETF was approved, hit 49,000. And we actually came all the way back to almost 38,000 so far. Now, again, will it come down as much as these past cycles? I don't know. I don't think so, because I think institutions will slowly eat up some of those Bitcoin. But it certainly just reminds us all that chasing and buying at highs, there's always, or at least most of the time, there's a better opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'd like to turn to talking about gold, obviously being, you know, a much more stable or, or less volatile market than Bitcoin. So how is that chart developing? And, you know, it really seems like there hasn't been much movement or volatility since the start of the year here. So as a trader, how do you view that market action? Yeah, so you're right on that. Very, very quiet. In fact, you know, we, we saw in December that kind of crazy wick up, which which again, I remind people that that was about 20 minutes when the futures on gold opened up on a Sunday night. So there wasn't much volume there. It was kind of almost a fluke event, probably wiped out some shorts there. But for the most part, we've been hammering on this 2080, 2075 level. And I actually love the fact that we're not pulling back very far. We've seen the dollar bounce substantially off of recent lows and gold's holding up. We've seen the VIX go down into the 12s now, which historically it means no one's fearful. And remember, fear is a great driving force for gold and no one's fearful and they're still not selling their gold, or at least there's buyers there. So I continue to be really bullish on on the price action in gold. I love showing this, guys. It, if you go back to 2014 through 2019, very similar, right? We kind of continued to pull back, hit, pull back, hit, hit, pull back, hit, and then we broke out and look at the bull run that followed. And so for me, at least, I'm kind of looking at it in the same situation where we've now been chopping underneath this level. When we break out, we should get a significant move to the upside. Uh, I have a target on around 25, a little over 2,500. Don't know if that'll be hit this year, but I think late this year, Year, early next year is really, really possible. And, and what you can do here too, by the way, is if you look at the last breakout here, it was in mid-2019. And basically by mid-2020, we had that full move. So whenever it does break out, I think that bull move probably comes, that full move can come within a year if it's if history is a good indicator. Mm -hmm. So does it really just basically need to break that upper trend line of that 2080 level to you, Gareth? I think so. I, I think for me, that 2080, what you want to see is you want to see a daily close because, right, it, it did quickly pierce it here. It pierced mm -hmm. it by a bigger margin here. You kind of hit it here again and pierced it. So you want to see a very good, solid close above. And then what I always like to see is a couple days where it stays above, right? Essentially, what it is, is it's establishing that 
now as a new range. So here, when we just jump above and it comes back below, it's not establishing itself. Like think about, you know, uh, you, you go to a, a, a hut, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, crappy house. You stay there for a couple months, you rebuild that house, you make it into your home. You're there, you're putting down your roots. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thought process with gold. It needs to get above that level and stay and kind of put in its roots. And once people see that it's put in its roots above that level, I think that's where it starts to take off. So look for a daily close above 2080 and then really look for you know three to five days at least where it stays above that level uh for consecutive days mm -hmm. how about silver gareth is it much of the same story for silver right now yeah so silver's a little trickier here and again you know silver i do worry that silver's become a little bit more of an industrial metal it's still a store of safety it's still a great metal but but needless to say it's, it's used in so many industrial ways that it certainly shows us a little bit more weakness than gold and a great example of this is if you look at the silver it's a down sloping trend line connecting all the highs remember gold it's a flat line so gold has been holding up around its highs much better than silver. And that just shows us that relative strength of, of the store, the pure store of safety versus something that's half industrial, half store of safety. Mm -hmm. Now, on the bigger time frame, we have this wedge pattern. And you can see how it just continues to hit, then bounce, then hit, then hit the upper range and kind of come back in. At some point, this range, we're going to break out one way or the other. I tend to favor the upside because I do th still think that, you know, we're still coming into a period where they probably do start printing more money. We know the national debt that's going to require X amount of payments on interest over a trillion dollars. Like it's unfortunately, as much as I say, I want our government and I do want them to get their spending under control. I fear that we have already made our bed and now it's time to kind of lie in it. There's, there's not a lot of options here. Mm -hmm. Um, and that ultimately should be a net positive for silver. So eventually, I think silver breaks out, but it's it's probably a little bit of a slower breakout than what we saw in gold. Having said that, down the line, we know silver generally outperforms gold. So once it finally does break out, you might get that bigger move than, than gold even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to try to understand the difference between silver as a monetary metal versus an industrial metal and when mm -hmm. it kind of reasserts or rebalances those demand sides for it. Absolutely. hundred percent. Gareth, I'd like to move to talking a little bit more about commodities. What are you seeing in oil right now? You know, we've seen a little bit of a pullback. Do you see that as a sustained move at this point? Yeah, so so oil's an interesting one. So if you ask me where I think oil is by year end, I honestly think it's lower. Um, I do think, again, if I'm correct, and I could be wrong, but if we do slip into a recession and China, again, still continues to struggle, then the demand for oil continues to drop while the U.S. production is just incredible, right? I mean, we are now fully, fine, uh, fully independent on an oil basis, energy basis, and we're producing more oil than pretty much any country in the world. Um, having said that, in the shorter term, so let's divide it from our longer term view to an our shorter term, there's an inverse head and shoulders here, right? So shoulder, head, and shoulder, right? So it's an upside down head and shoulders or, or person. What we did see here is a breakout about four days ago, five days ago. Now, based on calculations, this actually is a bullish indicator in the near term over the next two to four weeks, let's say. So oil may get a short-term bounce here back to maybe, let's say, 80 to $83 a barrel. Um, having said that, I still don't think we're going back to $100 a barrel anytime soon as the U.S. is just too dominant. So I would expect at some point for it to roll over again down the line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as part of that market, natural gas is something that we've spoken about before as well. So how are things looking in that market, considering much of the fear trade from last year has resolved itself? Yeah, natural gas is such a tricky one. And you know, I I do trade it and, and and I always find myself getting in and then it goes lower and then I got a dollar cost average and then I make money on it. But it's certainly not as simple and they call it a widow maker for for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Um having said that, you can see if we zoom out on this chart, natural gas is so low compared to its historical norms, at least going all the way back to, you know, basically you'd, you'd almost have to go back to 2020, the last time it was down in this range, which was that COVID period where where everyone thought the world was essentially ending. Mm -hmm. um, we did just yesterday get what we call a bottoming tail on the chart. So that is a bullish short-term indicator. So I, I am long myself uh, UNG right now, which is the ETF for natural gas. And I do think we have a chance of getting a little bit of an up move here back up, maybe back to about 250. But again, the same thing applies with oil is that I do think that it's somewhat limited based on 
how much production there is. And there's just so much production. So for me, there's no long-term trade on natural gas here. It's it's play the ranges, buy support, and then just sell it into resistance and look to rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. The next commodity I'd like to look at with you, Gareth, is copper. Mm -hmm. You know, this is obviously a real barometer of sorts for the economic activity in the world. So how does this chart look to you as well? Yeah, so this is a really interesting chart because we had a breakdown. So you could see this trend line right through here and how we broke below it. We then came back. And remember, this is when you're hitting it here at support, 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 support. And then it broke down. When you break support, it becomes resistance. Mm -hmm. And so then you could see how it comes back to that line, gets rejected, hits it again, gets it rejected. And interestingly enough, with the China stimulus just talked about, copper's gotten another bid. But what we have to recognize is that this line is still resistance. So even if we trade up here, it doesn't mean it's a new bull market at that point. We have to see if it gets through resistance. And as a technician, you you fade it essentially until proven otherwise. Until you get above that line and establish yourself, you always go on the side of it's resistance. It's going to get rejected. And so that's where I am right now is I, ultimately I think copper's headed lower. Kind of same thing. Second half of the year, I think we kind of dump out. I, I think that the stimulus measures will help a little bit in China, but it's not going to solve their issues. And then I also think, again, the U.S. is still still on pace at some point to have some sort of recession here. How deep a recession, I don't know. But um, but I will say that it's it's this is the longest period the U.S. has gone without a recession. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, and we're taking out COVID because it was a fluke right there anyways. But it's very normal for for, for economies to have expansionary periods and contraction. And in fact, you know, you, you look at it, it should be just like a natural rolling hill, like a contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. When the Federal Reserve gets involved and they start printing money, when the government spends this much money, it stops the normal course of things and makes us so we don't have a recession. Problem with that is that essentially you can only push it off for so long. When it does happen, it's going to be 10x worse. And that is the my fear right now is that when things finally get to that point, there's no amount of money that can be thrown at the system potentially that will save us. And again, that came, that may coincide with our 100-year cycle from the Great Depression. I, I hate to be a doom and gloomer on this, but, I, but I'm also someone who wants people to at least be aware, right? Um, and the last thing I'll say on this is like, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm preparing for like the end of the world, but I also want to know what the potential is. I want to analyze my risk reward as an investor, just as a person that's in charge of my family so that I can make sure that I'm putting things in place, whether it's some gold, whether it's some other things, make sure that I'm prepared for any outcome. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I asked you about these particular commodities, Gareth, is, you know, understanding them through the kind of that bigger macro lens of what they mean as economic barometers, kind of like we just talked about, about copper. So what do you see the prospects of a widespread, you know, maybe global recession because of these issues? Yeah, so you're right about that. I, I think copper is one of the best ones to look at in terms of what it what it's telling us about the global economy. And, and that's exactly right, right? I mean, we look at the run that copper had from 2020 all the way up to 2022 or so, and then the rollover here. And then we've broken this trend line, and that's where we're trading. And I think, again, what that's telling us is that the globe itself is going to go through a period of slower growth and probably a lot of recessions around the globe. And again, we're talking Europe, we're talking the UK, we're talking talking. China is obviously in it, but there's a lot of potential things to fall down here. And I could see us back below $3 on copper very, very easily by even end of this year, early next year. Mm -hmm. Gareth, I'd like to move to talking about psychology a little bit, you know, and, and the really the psychology of the market in general, especially when earnings season is coming out. And when a big name comes out like Netflix, for example, has a very positive announcement like they did yesterday, being the first big name to announce great things. So how does that affect the overall market? Yeah, so so the psychology of the market, it's such an important thing because again, you know, even as a technician, when I'm trading charts, a chart really, all it is is a representation of humans that are greedy or fearful. And those are the extremes, obviously. There's little middle grounds in between, but it's if you're if you're bullish, you're you're greedy, you think it's going up, you want to make money. If you're bearish, you're panicking, you're fearful, you want to sell. Um, so 
when you have something like Netflix where it comes out and it's the first big technology name and and it's a technology name that everyone knows, right? It's not like an arbitrary name that that no one has. I mean, we, I, I shouldn't say we all have Netflix because we don't all, but obviously they have hundreds of millions of subscribers. So there's a lot of people in this world that recognize that name brand. And when they hear that the stock is soaring, when they see that these numbers are beating across the board, what they do is they say, wow, this is great. The economy must be great. I'm, I'm happy. I'm excited. This must mean good things for me. And it tends to push the psychology into you know humans buying the market. And that's what we're seeing today. The stock market is having a great move. And, and Netflix is having a 12 and a 13% move to the upside and carrying the market. Now, other stocks like that would be Apple, right? Everyone knows Apple. So that's going to be a, a, a psych psychological factor for how people feel about the market. There's a couple other names like Tesla could be one as well. Although Tesla, again, I think is is you know, it's in the mix of a Ford and a GM as well, but but that one definitely is a name brand as well. So so you're right. The the psychology of investors is so important to understand and how it influences the market. Because in, in, in the scheme of things, you know, Netflix by no means, it's not one of the magnificent seven. It's not a trillion dollar company, but psychologically it was the first big tech name to report, and it's something that everyone recognizes. And especially that they're reporting huge subscriber growth, right? Right. I mean, that 13 million is incredible. I don't think anyone expected that. And that was the shocker there. So so I think that's a big thing. Now, the question you could ask is how many of those people of those 13 million were sharing passwords? And then when they cracked down, may, so maybe half of that number is just people that said, hey, you know, it's only 15 or 16 or whatever it is a month. You know, all right, I'll pay it now because, you know, they cracked down on it. That'll be interesting to see in the next couple quarters if that really falls off a cliff because it could have been that. Right. So staying with that psychology theme, how do you see it when a big institution comes out and provides a rating for a particular stock that is at its all-time highs? Does this generally mark a top because many analysts are still you know, human and want to chase these stocks as well? Yeah, and, and that's you are exactly right. And so the biggest thing to remember is analysts are human. Um, you know, some people will argue that there's an ulterior motive where the institutions want to sell in, so they have their analyst upgrade, which creates small buyers in the market. You know, I, I don't go to those those extremes necessarily because I think again that you know you know without proof it's hard to make those assumptions. But what I do know is human psychology, and and a human analyst is going to see it something ripping higher, feeling like they've missed the boat, and they want to FOMO in. And the way an analyst FOMOs in is by upgrading it and wants to be the biggest target on the street. They want to be recognized. They want to be talked about in the media. Oh, did you just hear this guy, you know, raising the price target to $3,000? Wow, you know, that's amazing. Everyone loves him, cheers him because they're long the stock. The problem is it. what that does is on a psychological basis, it ends up convincing anyone who was already on the sidelines and kind of like, eh, should I jump in or not? It gets them to jump in. It creates that FOMO feeling in an investor. And once you get everyone, so it basically freaks out anyone who is bearish and, and bears then go away. And then it gets those little bulls, the rest of the bulls, the ones that were on the fence to jump in. And you get to a point where there's no one left to buy the stock. And that's how tops are made. And so greatest example of this was Tesla back in 2021. Uh, you know, the analyst upgrades on this were absolutely ridiculous. You know, 1500 tar price target. You know, Kathy Woods had her crazy target as well. And and ultimately, that's where the top was marked. So what I do is when I when I find these ridiculous moves and NVIDIA could be a good example, like if we start seeing NVIDIA price targets of like fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. that would be some signal that we're probably at or near that top. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think about from, you know, a mechanistic standpoint, as well as a psychological standpoint of how these tops are met, and then how that buying pressure really gets exhausted when right. everybody jumps in, and then there's nobody left to keep bidding that price up. And then that's, you're that's just so true. really left with a probably a gap fill down, right? Yeah. And, and I always like to use simple examples. Right. And so so if you have five people that are in a stock and five people that are out. Right. So you have so you have five people in. If FOMO hits and all these five people buy, you now have 10 in, but you have zero left to buy. And so what ends up happening then is all it takes is one person to say, you know what, let me take profits. I need my money to buy a car or whatever. And the price goes down. And then that scares someone else into selling. And then, you know, before you know it, it's the chain reaction of selling where people start to freak out as price goes down and, and it all repeats in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Gareth. Well, I really appreciate you walking us through all of these different things today. Is there anything that you really have your eye on for this coming year here? 
Yeah. So, so for me, it's, it's this AI narrative, right? And as amazing as it is, I do wonder if, if, the competition that's coming is going to cause margins to collapse right now margins like for nvidia they're crazy it's like 80 percent margins and what we know is that tesla back in 2021 had incredible margins and so i'm using tesla kind of as my case for understanding what may happen to plays like nvidia so right now we see nvidia amazing chart keeps making new all-time highs but i do wonder in 6 12 months if the competition from all these other players starts to essentially erode the margins and so i think that again you know as as an investor if you have a 6 to 12 month horizon don't be surprised if nvidia comes back down significantly from these levels so that would be one thing to watch the other things to watch you know keep an eye on the jobs reports those are in amazingly important Keep an eye on inflation. PCE is on Friday. That's a favored gauge of inflation by the Fed. Um, and ultimately, you know, just be aware that that the Fed has never landed us at a soft landing before. So sure, could they do it? Yes. But again, I'm a probability trader, and I still think there's going to be some issue down the line that's going to surprise the Fed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, to your point, being in an election year, I think that they're going to do anything and everything in their power to keep things elevated. However, you make that point perfectly is that there is very likely a surprise ahead yeah. that they're not going to be able to foresee. And, and I think everyone's anticipating that. And I almost wonder if that puts us off sides in terms mm -hmm. of maybe the market does the opposite and actually does crap out later this year. And the reason I say that is because that actually happened in 2008. If we remember, you know, even Lehman Brothers failed just before the elections, right? And then uh, I remember Obama, he ended up taking over just before the March lows, right? He took over in January, markets bottomed in March of, of 09. So it's not to say that that's going to repeat, but just be aware that when everyone's like, oh, the Fed's going to make sure that nothing happens to the market, it lulls us into this false sense of confidence. And that's sometimes when things can go awry. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Gareth. Well, some great pieces of information to keep in mind here. For anybody that wants to follow more of your work, do you think the best place is at verifiedinvesting.com? Yeah, verifiedinvesting.com is an awesome place. Also, follow uh, my live show every morning at 9 a.m. I go live uh, to talk about markets, psychology, charts, technical analysis. Again, it's called The Game Plan, and that's free. Just log in on Twitter or on uh, on YouTube, and you guys can watch it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I caught the last couple episodes, and I think you guys are doing an excellent job with that. that show Thank there. you so much. Perfect. Excellent, Gareth. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.